Glaciology is the study of all the ice on our planet in all its forms. It could be snow in your garden, it could be the big ice sheets in Antarctica. Uh, and the study of that ice is the sort of things that glaciologists do. And how it began over 100 years ago, usually with the uh, study or the exploration of some polar regions. People going, being adventurous, going into the Alps, looking at the glaciers in the Alps, uh, exploring the Antarctic, exploring the Arctic, usually for, for commercial purposes. People will go into the Southern Ocean to look for whales and seals for oil. Uh, they were looking into the Arctic for the Northwest Passage uh, for, for shipping routes. But as they did so, they became uh, more scientifically interesting as places uh, because of the massive ice sheets, the huge ice cover that exists. Now, glaciology and ice on the planet can take several forms. You can have snow. People understand about glaciology because they know about snow. Uh, and so that's one element of it. Uh, in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, on the ocean, you get a very thin layer of ice that develops on the ocean, about a metre or so thick, and it's called sea ice. Uh, and it grows in the wintertime where it's dark and, and gets uh, really cold. Uh, and it shrinks in the summertime um, when the uh, earth warms up in the summer, of course, and the oceans get a bit warmer. Then there's uh, land ice. Now on land, you get ice which forms uh, by snowfall, and if the snow can last a year or two, then it starts to uh, de get denser and turn into ice. And in the upper regions of mountains, that ice forms as glaciers, occupying valleys within the mountains themselves. Uh, and so in the Alps, in many regions, uh, you get lots of glaciers. In the mountain regions, you get glaciers, and they're quite small, and they occupy um, little valleys. Now, occasionally, glaciers get much bigger, and they can occupy either an entire valley, or they could subsume a valley. And when they do that, they turn into ice sheets. And there are two massive ice sheets on the planet. One is in Greenland, and the other is in Antarctica. The Greenland ice sheets, if the whole thing melted, uh, all that water that was uh, in the ice would be in the sea, and the sea level will be seven metres higher than it is now all around the world. If the Antarctic ice sheet was to melt, then the sea level will be over 60 metres higher all around the world. So the study of ice on our planet is quite important to understand whether that's going to happen or not. Uh, and we use various techniques to, uh, to measure the ice and to understand how it behaves. The interesting thing about uh, ice is that it does flow. It's a solid, but if you apply a lot of stress onto it over um, a, a long time, it will start to, to flow very slowly. There are three ways in which a glacier can flow. Uh, one is by the deformation of the ice itself. So it just slowly flows downhill in a nice understandable kind of way. If there's water at the bed of the glacier underneath it, then the glacier can start to slip and, that, and you get sliding taking place. And if there is sediment underneath the glacier, and that sediment is wet, then the strength of that sediment is uh, very low indeed. And, and the, uh, the glacier can essentially move over a bed which has no strength at all. So it simply glides over the sediment. Uh, glaciers can flow that way, and parts of ice sheets can flow that way as well. Uh, so that's all very theoretical. Uh, we can measure glaciers and ice sheets traditionally going into the field put in stakes, metal stakes, in the ice, measuring where those metal stakes are, coming back the next year, uh, seeing where they are still, and looking at uh, the metal stake in one year, and then in the next year tells us how fast the glacier or the ice sheet has been flowing. And that's how we used to, to um, measure uh, uh, glaciers. These days, we use satellite information to understand how glaciers and ice sheets are, are flowing. And we have amazing detailed maps of not just the glaciers and the ice sheets themselves, but the velocity uh, over which they are starting to flow. So amazing knowledge uh, that we have. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do field work, and then field work's still very important in terms of understanding where melting is taking place. And so glaciers are ice, but the interaction with water is, is critical. They start to flow more quickly where there is water. And so understanding where the water is forming, how quickly it's forming, how that water is getting underneath the glacier is a major topic uh, for us right now. So we use theory to understand how ice is going to flow. We use measurements uh, to understand how it's going to flow. And we also use computer models as well, because computer models tell us about the past, how things have behaved in the past, and they tell us about the future. 
In glaciology, the past is actually quite important to us. Only 20,000 years ago was the last ice age. It was a time where there was ice over the Scandinavia, over Great Britain, over lots of parts of northern Russia, a continuous ice sheet there. Over North America, there was a massive ice sheet over North America uh, as well. Uh, and of course, all those ice sheets have now uh, disappeared. And what they've left behind is this wonderful network of evidence to tell us that they were once there in terms of the geology that they've left behind. So we can work out where the ice sheets used to be based on the geology, and we can use numerical modeling to reconstruct what those ice masses once looked like, and we can get those right. Once we understand the past and be able to model the past, and we understand the present, do all the measurements, we understand the present as well, what we can then do is think about how those ice sheets and glaciers are going to change in the future. So our models are quite good now. We've got good theory, which details how they flow. We've got lots of measurements, which details about the surface of the ice, about the thickness of the ice, and all of those sort of things. And we have brilliant models, which tell us how they're going to change in future. So glaciers are, are around at the moment. There are, there are uh, two major ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, and there are roughly 300,000 other glaciers. And it's a reasonable question to say, well, where did they appear from? Where, where did they start? And there are a number of things to, to answer that question. The ice sheets over uh, Greenland and Antarctica have been around for, for hundreds of thousands of years. And in Greenland, probably it was much smaller um, about 125,000 years ago than it is now. Uh, and maybe parts of Antarctica were also um, uh, smaller about that time. But they were also um, persistently glaciated for, for several million years in, in those regions. The smaller glaciers on the planet, they grow and shrink much more quickly. So in the Ice Age, the glaciers would have expanded quite a lot, and they would have retreated when we got into the, the interglacial, where we are right now. About 150 years ago, we were in something called the Little Ice Age, which was a period in, in Earth history where things were just a little bit cooler than they are uh, uh, right now. Not too much, just a, just a little bit. And um, what that meant is that the glaciers around the northern hemisphere, northern Europe in particular, they expanded uh, quite a lot. Uh, and so what we're starting to see now is the, is the retreat of glaciers from the Little Ice Age, going back to more normal conditions. But of course, uh, what we're seeing also is, is man-made global warming, which is causing the glaciers to retreat even further back. So there's no glacier um, area, no region of, of where glaciers occur on the planet, which isn't shrinking right now. All the glaciers are melting back right now. Uh, a little bit is, is a response to the, last I, to the Little Ice Age, but actually most of it is due to global warming. So the reason to study glaciology is twofold. Firstly, it's interesting, right? I mean, it's cu curious to study ice. Some of the least explored parts on our planet are glaciated regions, and so it's interesting scientifically to find out about them. But there's a, another driver, and that is because if the ice melts, that water goes into the sea and the sea level goes up. And understanding future sea level change is, a, is one of the major concerns for societies all around the world. There are 250 million people living very close to the ocean right now. And if sea level goes up by a metre or two, they'll become displaced and they'll have to move somewhere else. So it's a major, major problem. So we ask ourselves a number of questions in glaciology. How likely is that to happen? How likely is it to get one or two metres of sea level change, say, in the next 100 or so years? Well, we can measure and, and monitor how the ice is behaving now. And what we see is all the glaciers are melting. Uh, in West Antarctica, the ice is shrinking. And in Greenland, uh, the ice is losing mass right, right now. So that's that. Uh, we can think about the past as well. Well, how likely is it that we will get a meter or two of sea level rise? Between the last ice age, 20,000 years ago, and the period in time uh, that, that we're in now, the interglacial between ice ages, sea level went up because of melting of the ice by 120 metres in about 10,000 years. That was 1.2 metre every century for that entire time. So you put it in context, we've got two massive ice sheets on the planet now. The precedent from the past is when the world warms, the ice melts and the sea level goes up. And the lesson from history, not very far back in history, just 20,000 years ago, is that sea level can go up by tens of metres at a rate of about a metre or two every century. The rate of sea level change going on right now is about 32 centimetres per 100 years. The interglacial 
glacial transition is about 1.2 metres. So we're within an order of magnitude in that. But the thing to note is that the rate of sea level rise is going up. It was at around about 8 centimetres per 100 years at the end of the 19th century. It was at about 20 centimetres per 100 years in the middle of the 20th century, and now it's at 32. And that rate is going to continue for sure. So the only way to predict the future realistically is with numerical models. And all the models will point to further ice sheet melting. And sea level change of half a metre or more by the end of this century is highly likely. Sea level change of a metre or more by the end of the century is completely possible. So the big question in glaciology right now is how the big ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, how they are going to change. So we have some models that are predicting that they will change. But what are the processes that are going to cause that change? The processes are going to be important because they'll tell us how quickly the ice will, will melt. The big issues in Antarctica are, for example, are around the floating parts of ice uh, in Antarctica. So the grounded ice, the ice that's stuck on the bed, um, is, is very thick three or four kilometres in, in places. But as you get closer toward the edge of the ice sheet, the, the ice starts to thin. And in places where it's in water, that ice becomes a float. And once it's floating, it's called an ice shelf. The ice shelves are very important for the stability of ice in Antarctica. They hold back the grounded ice. They act as a, as a back force to keep that grounded ice upstream from flowing too fast into the ocean. The thing is, you can melt the ice to cause sea level change, but you can also flow it into the ocean. Once the, ocean, once the ice is floating, it's already displaced its weight in water, according to Archimedes' principle, and the sea level rise has already happened. That ice can melt in its own time, could take 100 years, could take 1,000 years, it doesn't matter, the sea level rise has already happened. So stopping the ice in Antarctica from flowing into the ocean is critical for, for sea level. And it's the stability, not of the ice sheet, but of the floating ice shelf that becomes really important. So there are a couple of ice shelves in the northern part of the Antarctic Peninsula, where it's quite warm, that have collapsed, completely collapsed, within uh, a few weeks. So Larsen A and Larsen B ice shelves were doing their job, holding back the ice, doing quite well. And then surface water appeared on them. And some of that surface water started to run off. Well, that's all fine. The water can run off, no problems. But then what happened was the surface water stopped running off and started running into the ice shelf. And once it does that, you get holes, vertical holes appearing in the ice shelf. And the whole structure of the ice shelf, um, the integrity of the ice shelf becomes compromised. And what happened in Larsen A and Larsen B is just that. The meltwater started going down into the ice shelf. And as a consequence, the whole ice shelf broke up catastrophically within just a matter of a few weeks, maybe a few days. So that's the process by which you can get rid of a, an ice shelf really quickly. And that's what we're worried about in Antarctica, how many of these big ice shelves that are protecting the very large volumes of ice grounded upstream, how many of those ice shelves are vulnerable right now? This is something that 20 years ago we weren't really researching too much, but it's becoming really important. And the more we learn about ice shelves in Antarctica, the more that we start to see there is water in some of them. We don't yet know whether the structure of those ice shelves are, are weakened yet, but that's the hot topic at the moment to understand. Because if the ice shelves disappear, then the ice starts to flow more quickly into the ocean, and then we get much more sea level rise. <laughs>